On today's episode, we are getting into the latest space news, including a new high-performance Starlink internet service, India going to the moon, followed by robots orbiting the moon, NASA and SpaceX are investigating the Dragon capsule parachute, and the SLS rocket is off track yet again with another delay. So let's get going. This is the Space Race. Earlier this month, the SpaceX Starlink website was updated to include a new high-performance option, Starlink Premium. This is the first time SpaceX has added the choice for different tiers of service on its satellite internet service. Previously, there was only one single product offered. On the site, SpaceX describes Starlink Premium as having more than double the antenna capability of Starlink, delivering faster internet speeds and higher throughput for the highest demand users, including businesses. Elon Musk himself tweeted recently about the new terminal, writing, This is twice the area of our standard phased array with a broader scan angle. Standard Starlink has an expected download speed of 50 to 250 megabits per second and an expected upload speed of 10 to 20 while Starlink Premium roughly doubles those speeds with expected download speeds of 150 to 500 megabits per second and expected upload speeds of 20 to 40. Folks can order now to make a reservation and deliveries are supposed to start in the second quarter of this year, so sometime after March. The high-performance terminal itself looks pretty similar to the existing second-generation terminal, which is rectangular now. SpaceX have done away with the first-generation round dish for Starlink. The updated system is smaller, lighter, and more energy efficient. The high-performance receiver features improved resistance to extreme weather conditions. Users will also benefit from 24-7 prioritized support. Starlink's standard package was already a little bit pricey with a $500 US dollar hardware cost and a monthly fee of $100. Bucks. Not cheap, but SpaceX claimed they were still selling it at a loss, so still a very good deal for the consumer. Especially since many users would be limited to other lower speed and higher priced satellite internet options without it. This performance tier is definitely not for the average user. After a $500 deposit, the service will cost $2,500 for the hardware and $500 per month for the service. This is a steep price for sure, but could still be worth it in a business situation if you can make more money with the service than without it. A startup aerospace company called Quantum Space, which is led by a former administrator of NASA, has announced plans to develop orbital platforms around the moon that will be serviced by robotic vehicles to support a range of technology applications. That's a lot to take in just now. So, Quantum Space was formed very recently, just last year, but they have some very heavy hitters in charge. Former NASA head Steve Jurchik is one of the three co-founders. Another is Ben Reed, former Division Chief of Exploration and In-Space Services at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center. The third co-founder is Cam Gafarian, who also co-founded the commercial space station company Axiom Space and lunar lander developer Intuitive Machines. Quantum Space announced earlier this month that it's starting work on a spacecraft platform that would initially operate at the Earth-Moon L1 Lagrange point. This is about 60,000 kilometers away from the moon in the direction of the Earth. Just for scale, the total distance between the Earth and the moon is 384,000 kilometers, so this is much closer to the moon than it is to the Earth. That platform would be serviced by another spacecraft that would deliver and install payloads. Jurchik says he envisions multiple types of vehicles that quantum space can build in the coming years to aid with the future influx of moon missions. First, the company hopes to create a robotic outpost that could potentially help with communication in the region of space between regular Earth orbits and the moon, known as cislunar space. Along with communications, the outpost could also do observations of Earth or the lunar surface, as well as host payloads for collecting data on the lunar environment. The company also envisions providing space traffic services for spacecrafts traveling around the moon. This is a very solid idea. We talk a lot about how low Earth orbit is already becoming very congested with satellites and space junk. 
this new quantum space project would be going to a place where no one else is right now. Jurchik said in an interview, we think that there's an opportunity to be the first to deploy capabilities in cislunar space to support NASA and Artemis and to support the national security community and its requirements there. There are no other legacy systems there to compete with, end quote. The Indian space program has their sights set on launching the Chandrayaan-3 lunar lander mission this August. The mission will mark India's second attempt to land a spacecraft on the moon. You may remember the 2019 failed attempt when the Chandrayaan-2's Vikram lander and its onboard rover crashed into the lunar surface. It basically just failed to slow down enough and landed too hard. Some kind of computer malfunction. Chandrayaan-2's accompanying orbiter is still circling the moon and will serve as a communications relay for the Chandrayaan-3 lander and rover. India's science and technology minister Jitendra Singh said in a statement earlier this month, based on the learnings from Chandrayaan-2 and suggestions made by the national level experts, the realization of Chandrayaan-3 is in progress. Many related hardware and their special tests are successfully completed. The launch is scheduled for August 2022, end quote. Chandrayaan-3 is planned for launch from India's Satish Dhawan Space Center aboard the geosynchronous satellite launch vehicle Mark III rocket. They don't get very creative with the rocket names in India. After reaching the moon, Chandrayaan-3 will attempt to land about 70.9 degrees south of the lunar equator, and if successful, this will make India just the fourth country after the United States, Russia, and China to successfully soft land on the moon. NASA and SpaceX are investigating the delayed opening of a parachute on a Cargo Dragon spacecraft that recently returned to Earth, an incident that is concerningly similar to one that took place on a Crew Dragon spacecraft last year. NASA confirmed earlier this month that the Cargo Dragon spacecraft that splashed down off the coast of Florida on January 24th suffered a delayed opening of one of its four main parachutes. Even so, the capsule was able to land perfectly safely in the water. NASA spokesman Josh Finch said in a statement, quote, During the return of the SpaceX CRS-24 mission, teams observed a single main parachute that lagged during inflation like the return of the Crew-2 mission. The vertical descent rate of both flights was within the system design margins at splashdown, and all four main parachutes fully opened prior to splashdown on both missions, end quote. NASA and SpaceX are reviewing the parachute data ahead of the Crew-4 launch, which is scheduled for mid-April, and the subsequent return of the Crew-3 Dragon spacecraft, which is currently docked at the station. A commercial Crew Dragon flight to the International Space Station, supporting Axiom's Space Axe 1 mission, is scheduled for launch March 30th, returning before the Crew-4 launch. Finch went on to say, quote, As partners, NASA and SpaceX jointly review the imagery data and perform physical inspection of the drogue and many parachutes after flight. The inflation model also continues to be updated to better characterize and understand margins and splashdown conditions. This review of flight data and parachute performance models will be completed prior to the launch of the Crew-4 mission and the return of Crew-3 astronauts from the International Space Station, end quote. So that's not to say that there is anything necessarily wrong or even dangerous with the Dragon capsule and its parachute system. It's clearly working just fine even when it doesn't reach the optimal parachute deployment, but agencies like NASA like to be very careful about not normalizing deviance as it's known. We can't just ignore data because it did not create an immediate safety risk at the time because it could still pose a long-term hazard. In simpler words, we don't want to wait around to find out what happens when two parachutes are slow to deploy. Let's figure out why the one is being sketchy and fix that right now. NASA is postponing the first rollout of the Space Launch System rocket by one month in order to give workers more time to complete vehicle preparations. The latest development from NASA specifically involves how soon SLS and Orion will conduct a wet dress rehearsal, the final major test before launch. NASA had previously planned to conduct the wet dress rehearsal sometime this month, but the space agency's updated forecast is now no earlier than March. 
NASA officials explained that there isn't one single issue at fault for pushing back the final test before the first SLS launch. Instead, the cause was described as a list of remaining work left to do before the uncrewed rocket can safely fly. The agency also emphasized that it doesn't want to put a firm target on when the first Artemis 1 mission will begin. The hesitation is to avoid putting any pressure on engineers who are completing safety tests before liftoff. In fairness to NASA, extra precautions are required because the launch vehicle has never flown before, and this is a very high stakes test flight. Artemis 1 is a days long mission to deliver NASA's Orion spacecraft to lunar orbit and back to Earth safely and the second Artemis mission will be the first crewed lunar flyby mission under the Artemis program. So if this launch fails, it will literally destroy NASA's return to the moon. The first SLS launch was supposed to go like any other rocket test, a simple trip to Earth orbit and back again, but there have been so many delays with this spaceship that they've had to jump straight to making its first ever launch a mission to the damn moon. That's more pressure than should ever be put on a maiden voyage of a new ship. For comparison, SpaceX destroyed like five starships just doing suborbital flight testing with it. And they're fully expecting that the first launch and return of the orbital starship Super Heavy will fail spectacularly. Of course, the plan is for a controlled water landing on both rocket stages, but Elon Musk has said that Starship is unlikely to make it back down in one piece on the first attempt. They might even destroy another five ships before they get orbital launches and landings perfected, and that's the fundamental difference between how SpaceX and NASA operate. SpaceX has the philosophy of fail early and fail often, because we learn best from our mistakes. While NASA have reached a point where they'll happily spend a decade perfecting a rocket for the first launch, rather than allow it to explode even one time. If you were in that rocket, would you rather launch in a starship that has been gradually perfected over the course of many failures and rebuilds, or launch in an SLS that has only flown once before, but flown perfectly that one time? It's a tricky question, right? Let us know what you prefer in the comments below. Meet us back here every week for more updates on everything aerospace industry and interstellar exploration related. Make sure to give the video a thumbs up today if you liked it, that really helps us out for real. And subscribe to the Space Race for more videos just like this. We do one long form essay and one news update every week. And if you'd like more, we've got two more on the screen for you right now.